What are the satellite internet options that RVers and boaters should be aware of? Is it more than just Starlink? Actually, it is. There's some really interesting technologies out there and some companies up to some cool stuff. We've got a rundown of all the players and what's coming and when. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Chris with the Mobile Internet Resource Center here to give you an update on the state of satellite internet, particularly focused on the needs of mobile RVers and cruisers like us who want to be connected wherever we travel to. And well, sometimes cellular and Wi-Fi just isn't an option and satellite is the best way to go. And well, getting connected via space is just pretty darn cool. But who are you going to connect with? Is there other type? players than just SpaceX that you should be considering? And how is this going to be changing in the future? So every so often we kind of step back and take a big picture look at the state of the satellite internet industry and run down who the players are, what they're working on, and what is coming next. And there is some really interesting stuff in the pipeline as of early 2024 when we're recording this video. There's, of course, SpaceX and Starlink, there's Amazon's Project Kuiper, there is OneWeb, there is the legacy satellite providers like Aviasat and HughesNet who have some interesting new satellites in orbit. And then there's a whole new wave of direct to cellular capabilities that will enable everyday cell phones, even the phone you might already have, to talk directly to satellites with new technologies on them. So there's some interesting stuff in orbit that you should know about, and it's kind of fun. So let's dive into all the interesting players and see what's up with them. First up, SpaceX and Starlink. Now, if you don't know about Starlink, you've probably been living under a rock for a while because, well, Starlink is everywhere, quite literally everywhere. They have global coverage. At the moment, SpaceX has got coverage around the world, across the oceans, up to the poles, um, and legally in 70 different countries. Going forward into 2024, they will be expanding into the remainder of the world's countries that they don't have legal service and yet finishing up the ground infrastructure and licensing that is required. And will probably by the end of 2024 have most of the world covered other than the kind of holdout countries like Iran, Russia, China, North Korea, and the other places that are very unlikely to ever sign them up with a legal license. But SpaceX has been basically evolving at ludicrous speed and they're not done yet. Now, the big issue that SpaceX has run into is so many people have been signing up for Starlink service is that speeds have actually in a lot of areas been going down rather than up. Even though SpaceX has been launching potentially dozens of satellites a week, they're not keeping up with the demand. And going forward, they have big plans to bring out a next generation of satellites that will address this. The SpaceX's Starlink satellites are going to be evolving from the original V1 uh, generation of satellites to what they're calling the V2 generation of satellites, the version two. These are much more capable, bigger, physically bigger, might have much more solar power on them, Starlink satellites that can process a lot more data, communicate to more people, and um, carry along additional extra payloads like, well, we'll be talking a little bit later about direct to cellular that is actually gonna be riding along on some Starlink satellites in partnership with T-Mobile. But these bigger satellites need a bigger launch vehicle to get into orbit. And that is going to be the exciting story of 2024 is will SpaceX be able to get their big giant Starship launcher off the ground and into orbit? And if so, how quickly will they be able to get to the point of being able to deploy these next generation Starlink satellites? Um, when Starship started to slip schedules, um, uh, SpaceX actually went to a plan B and they started to do what they call the V2 Mini, a version of their next generation satellite that fits on the current Falcon rockets that they've been launching, the smaller rockets, but they can only launch 20, 25 of those satellites at a time. And so to really continue to economically expand um, the Starlink network, we're going to be watching to see how well SpaceX does in getting Starship off the ground. So that's going to be the story of 2024 to watch. So stay tuned. But well, Starlink isn't the only player in town. So let's dive into who else might be competing with them. The 
the next big potential Starlink competitor is Amazon's Project Kuiper. Now, you know, to keep to have any hope of catching up with SpaceX and the huge lead they have with Starlink is going to require a huge investment. And Amazon has basically said they're willing to write a blank check. They're investing billions in Project Kuiper and they've been working on this for years. And as of late 2023, they finally launched their first few test satellites and they've been reporting that, well, they work. So they've been able to prove that their technology works. They've got a, um, a very capable system that uses laser interlinks to tie the satellites together. They're gonna to be launching um, over 3000 is the proposed constellation that they have. And well, they proved it works. Now going into 2024, it is time for Amazon to actually put up or shut up. And by put up, I mean put up into orbit. They've basically gone and booked all the launch capacity around the world that they can get their hands on to start launching their constellation at an extremely rapid rate to try and play catch up and to get service online. And so we'll be watching Amazon very closely to see what comes with Project Kuiper. By the end of 2024, they're hoping to have some beta service, being kind of in a beta testing service with partners and heading into 2025 and 2026, the constellation might start being ready for uh, interesting consumer use. Now to keep people, you know, kind of interested in the meantime, Amazon has shown a preview of the, the data terminals that they're going to be show, using for Kuiper. And they're actually pretty interesting. The smallest is only a seven inch square. That would be probably very interesting for mobile users. And um, their mainstream dish is only an 11 inch square. And Amazon says that'll be capable of 400 megabits per second and will cost them less than $400 to manufacture. So there's some interesting stuff coming with Kuiper. And well, maybe by the end of this year, we'll know more. So definitely something to keep an eye on is what is Amazon up to with their constellation? Now, the third constellation that we've been tracking here for years is OneWeb. And at one point, OneWeb seemed like they were going to be the first to have a fully functional constellation in orbit, even ahead of SpaceX's and SpaceX and Starlink. But well, OneWeb hit so many roadblocks, and we've done videos and covered this in the past that they basically stumbled and stumbled and stumbled and bankruptcies and uh, wars and everything that could go wrong did go wrong for OneWeb. But in 2023, they finally finished building out their constellation and now do have global service with um, speeds up to 200 megabits per second, uh, very low latency. So they've, they've got a fully functional um, very interesting OneWeb constellation uh, out there over our heads right now. But one thing that has changed with OneWeb over their many reinventions of their business model over the years is that their initial focus on bringing internet to, um, you know, low cost internet to the consumer market and to everyday people everywhere is now switched to a focus on big enterprise customers, government customers, and um, well, through their partnership with Kaimeta, they now have products that are targeting the super yacht market, you know, big expensive dishes with big expensive data plans for people with big expensive boats. So for most of our audience, OneWeb, though their constellation is finally built and finally in service, it really isn't a consideration. Going forward into the future, OneWeb does have a next generation constellation in the works for like 27. 2027 and 2028 that might basically you know, relaunch them to a new, bigger, broader market. So we'll be keeping an eye on OneWeb, but for the time being, their constellation is not quite as exciting as the others. Now, those three constellations we just covered were all low Earth orbit satellite constellations. So these are satellites that it requires hundreds or thousands of satellites at a lower orbit over Earth, where the satellites are constantly moving through the sky over your head. But that means that to have coverage, to have a satellite always overhead requires potentially hundreds or thousands of satellites. Otherwise, it'll pass over the horizon and it might be 15, 20, 30 minutes until the next low Earth orbit satellite comes by. The traditional um, satellite industry used geostationary satellites that rather than being low to Earth are 22,000 miles up over the equator, so they're in a fixed point in the sky. So you aim at them and they don't move relative to the ground. And those type of satellites, because they're not moving, they can have a 
be built a lot bigger and have a lot more capacity that is then focused down on their target areas beneath them. So that's how legacy satellites worked. And until these new low Earth orbit constellations came along, that was just the way satellite communication was for uh, internet options. These legacy providers have kind of been eclipsed by the excitement of the low Earth orbit constellations that have um, lower latencies and potentially faster real world speeds. But these legacy providers are not sitting still. And the, the two that you know, we've been tracking actually have new satellites that came online in 2023. First up is Viasat, um, which had some consumer service under the Exceed brand at one point in the past. Um, they've been working on what they're calling the Viasat 3 uh, system, which is going to be three gigantic geosynchronous satellites that would provide global coverage from these huge satellites uh, out over the equator, spaced out around the Earth. And this was originally going to launch in 2019, and they even talked to us about plans that they had for the RV market and uh, supporting mobile users, and they were quite excited about this. But, well, Viasat didn't launch in 2019. It didn't launch until 2023 was the first of these Viasat 3 satellites launched. And this is a big, complicated satellite. It was going to unfold what's going to be the largest antenna ever put on a civilian satellite in orbit. And that unfolding failed. So Viasat has been betting their company on this new generation satellite with all this amazing capacity. It was so late, and then it failed. And, well, their, their past year has been trying to figure out what went wrong how they can prevent that from happening to the next two satellites of that Viasat 3 constellation and trying to reinvent themselves. And hopefully they will get back on track. The um, next satellite of the Viasat 3 constellation will launch towards the end of 2024, the third one in 2025, and maybe Viasat will be back in the game then. But in, it's just been a rough year for Viasat, and it's really, they're kind of a... Uh, um, feeling like a stumbling dinosaur in a lot of ways. They have some interesting partnerships and actually have merged with uh, some more traditional satellite companies. So interesting things might be afoot, but not anytime soon. We will keep an eye on Viasat, but that's, that's what's up with them. The other legacy satellite provider that so many uh, RVers from old school days know is HughesNet. You know, HughesNet used to be the only game in town for satellite uh, internet for RVers and who were traveling into really remote areas with big tripod mounted dishes or robotic roof mounted dishes on top of class A's that could lock onto HughesNet satellites and get you some slow but you know, generally workable sat internet anywhere. And that was revolutionary 15, 20 years ago. Um, but, well, HughesNet's satellites have not kept up. They have not been able to launch a new satellite since 2016, and their network was so capacity constrained that it couldn't handle the demands of streaming and modern uh, internet users. So, so many people have been fleeing HughesNet over the years to Starlink and cellular and other options. Um, HughesNet's been hoping to get back on track with a new generation satellite. They're calling theirs Jupiter-3, and it did launch in 2023, and Unlike Viasat, it did not have trouble unfolding. It is now fully in service, and this is letting HughesNet kind of reinvent themselves with a whole new line of service that um, is now up to 100 megabits per second speed, so much faster than they were able to offer before, and no more data constraints. They have unlimited data. They're kind of using a, a priority data versus standard data like the cellular carriers use, but you can now have unlimited data on HughesNet satellites if you're using Jupiter 3. Sounds kind of cool. Is there, are, are they back in the game? And they're, they're pricing for data plans. It's, it's, they're deeply undercutting Starlink. So they've got some very affordable data plans as well. But well, for mobile users, Jupiter 3 has got a big catch. And that is the HughesNet dishes require uh, professional installation and aiming on a fixed structure. So maybe for a seasonal house or a cabin or a, someplace you go on occasion, um, that could be a good service to have, but it is not mobile compatible at the moment. And, well, you're signing up for a two-year contract. So that is a big downside for HughesNet. Maybe in the future there will be um, some resellers who come up with you know, uh, new mobile options and robotically aimed dishes that are compatible with this and that bring Jupiter 3 service to a mobile audience. But for right now, well, it's not really an option 
for our audience. But if you're in a fixed place, well, they're, they're, they're back in the game. They've got some interesting uh, technology, including their um, fusion plans that actually combine the HughesNet satellite signal with cellular signal from a local partner to give you the lower latency of, of cellular combined with the potential high speeds signal from the Jupiter satellite. So some interesting stuff from HughesNet, but not necessarily mobile friendly at the moment. Now, the final and really exciting area of satellite internet technologies to pay attention to heading into 2024 is the revolution happening with satellite direct to cell. This is kind of almost like sci-fi technologies coming into play where satellites in orbit are learning how to communicate directly to cell phones. In some cases, even existing phones that you might already have without even needing to buy a new phone. This is some pretty amazing, um, technical and uh, cellular engineering and satellite engineering going on. And there's a couple players who are doing this in several interesting different ways. First up is Apple. And Apple actually was the first to bring out direct to cell service with the iPhone 14 and um, again with the iPhone 15, building in a radio into those devices that is compatible with Global Star's satellite uh, network that was kind of a, a, the network behind the spot trackers and a few other satellite messaging devices that give you basic low bandwidth messaging and um, tracking locations and everything like that. And well, sat Apple built this in and has SOS messaging. So if you're out of signal, out of service anywhere, you can use your iPhone and talk to emergency services. But that's all you can do with an iPhone 14 or 15 is basically talk to emergency services via text messaging. Does Apple have bigger plans for what that messaging looks like in the future? And does it expand beyond messaging? Odds are good, yes. Apple is actually funding Global Star to build a next generation of Global Star's constellation. Apple is putting up 95% of the funding and is reserved for themselves 85% of the capacity for a, a evolved Global Star system that will have some more advanced direct to sell capabilities. So that system will not be really coming online until 2026 or 2027. It'll be really interesting to see what Apple plans to do with it, but Apple tends to be really good at keeping secrets and who knows what they might be rolling out in the meantime until that next generation constellation is online. But Apple is up to some interesting direct to sell stuff. The, the other direct to sell uh, endeavor that has gotten a lot of press is Starlink. Starlink has a direct to sell payload that they've been teasing about for year, well over a year now, and they finally have just in January 2024 launched the first six test satellites. So these are Starlink satellites, and they're not Starlink talking to cellular. These are Starlink satellites with a piggyback payload that is a separate basically cell tower in space payload that is using borrowed T-Mobile cellular spectrum in the United States to talk directly to existing 4G cell phones. So probably the phone you have, if you're on T-Mobile, um, SpaceX is building a system that will be able to talk directly to you. And a lot of people get excited about this. They think this is going to be Starlink service to their phone. That is actually not the case. This is a piggyback payload that is a tiny sliver of T-Mobile spectrum that is initially focused on text messaging, but it had leaves space to evolve to voice calls and to eventually even some low bandwidth data filling in, basically making a world without coverage holes and coverage gaps. Um, you know, in the US in partnership with T-Mobile and in around the world in partnership with other carriers. So this is really exciting stuff. And SpaceX has demonstrated it working. They have shown two phones sending a text message to each other via space. That is exciting. What are, when are we gonna be able to actually get this ourselves? Um, SpaceX currently has just a test license. They have to prove that this works without causing interference. That runs through June 2024. They're going to be launching test satellites to do this and um, testing it out with T-Mobile. And assuming all goes well, later in 2024, they will probably begin to bring out commercial service in a beta fashion and into 2025 
um, they'll have some potentially the, enough capacity for voice and maybe even some limited data. So T-Mobile's got a very exciting roadmap and SpaceX has got a very exciting roadmap working together to bring this out. But to really see this direct to sell technology deploy, it is again going to be dependent on SpaceX getting that Starship launcher working because the direct to sell payload is a big extra payload that makes the Starlink satellites you know, basically too big to economically launch on the small Falcon rockets. They need to be able to launch dozens or hundreds at a time, and that's going to require Starship. So we'll see how quickly Starship gets off the ground to see just how quickly Starlink's direct to sell rolls out. But it's up there now. They're proving it. It's testing it. It seems to be working. It's pretty exciting. Now, SpaceX has gotten a lot of headlines for their direct-to-sell initiative with T-Mobile, but they were far from the first looking to have satellites talk to existing cell phones. One of the other companies that has really been pioneering this technology is AST Space Mobile. Their satellites are building a low Earth orbit constellation of satellites that are really, really big. They have a giant antenna that unfolds. And because their antenna is so physically big, they're saying that they're actually hoping to be able to have the satellites able to penetrate and communicate with phones even indoors, not just outside under a clear sky. And because their signal is so big and wide, they're hoping to actually have potentially broadband speeds and well their test satellite launched towards the end of 2023 their big blue walker 3 test satellite proved that they can build an unfolding antenna that works that seems to be functional and they've been doing demonstrations in partnership with AT&T doing uh, text messaging voice calls and they've even shown off uh, 14 megabit per second data streaming and video from satellite to a regular everyday unmodified phone on AT&T's network. So Space Mobile is pretty exciting. Um, now that they've proven their technology, AT&T and Google have both invested substantially into helping Space Mobile fund actually launching enough satellites to bring commercial service and not just test service out. But well, they've got a lot to build and a long way to go. So it's going to be interesting to see how quickly they can actually do something with um, this technology. But it is exciting. And again, this is in partnership with AT&T. So T-Mobile and SpaceX and AT&T and Space Mobile. And well, Verizon has some sort of partnership with Amazon's Kuiper, but how that might be playing with direct to sell hasn't been revealed yet. There is one other direct to sell player of note that is actually demonstrating. They were actually the first to demonstrate sending a text message to a phone from space, and that is Link Communications. And they have very tiny satellites, and they seem to be at first focused primarily on text messaging. And because they are not planning to have enough satellites to provide 24 7 coverage anytime soon, their satellites will spread out and maybe have messages go through every you know, 30 minutes or so. So you'll your text messages will pop up every so often, but it's happening via satellite. And Link has been signing up partners around the world. They've got a partnership with Rogers in Canada, but no partners in the United States yet. And they have just begun to deploy actual commercial service in a few places, but so far it seems their markets are focused on tiny Pacific Island nations like the Solomon Islands. So it will be interesting to see Link is not have the, the huge investments like um, the other companies have. So it'll be interesting to see if they're able to get their messaging service um, off the ground and start to expand it and take it out to a wider audience. In particular, will it ever matter to North American nomads? Um, or will it maybe just be a way that uh, boaters in remote places can maybe get text messages and weather updates? Interesting to see. And again, their satellites are in orbit. They've proven that they can work. They just now need to build a lot more of them to start getting coverage out there. Okay, to wrap all this up, it's in some ways it feels like nothing has changed in the last several years when it comes to satellite internet options because it's basically been SpaceX and, well, everybody else. And that is still how it is at the beginning of 2024. But we're starting to see some really interesting movement with new players coming online, new technologies coming online. And there's actually a whole bunch of other proposed constellations and technologies that we're not going to cover in this video that are covered in the longer article that goes along with this. So come over to the Mobile Internet Resource Center and read and dive deeper to see all these different companies that we are tracking that is going to make space more interesting than ever before. But the important thing to know as we as, as we conclude is that so many people wonder well 
is space going to replace cellular? Are satellites going to replace cellular service? Is this going to be what finally lets me ditch my cell carrier? And so many people get excited about that, and they think that's where the future is going, and nothing could be further from the truth. And in fact, what we are seeing is satellite and cellular becoming more and more entwined as complementary technologies. Satellites will never be able to have the capacity of a cell tower plugged into a fiber optic network to the heart of the internet. So in places where it makes sense to have cell towers, they're going to have better performance than a satellite hundreds or thousands of miles overhead will be able to offer. But on the other hand, satellites, cellular will never be able to provide coverage all the places that satellites can. It's a both and situation, not an either or. And that is why we are seeing the satellite and the cellular companies partnering together more and more closely, um, as we're seeing with Apple and Global Star, uh, AT&T and Space Mobile, T-Mobile and uh, SpaceX, um, Amazon and um, um, Verizon, and so on. These are all partnerships that are happening. This is not a, a cellular industry versus satellite industry story. So this is going to be an exciting future. We're going to heading into a world where you know, dead zones will start to evaporate. It'll become more complicated than ever to understand how you're connected and what the traits of that particular connection are, which makes for well, kind of an exciting time to be mobile and connected out in the world. So I'm excited about this. I'm excited to, to have all these different options to stay connected. If you are too, let us know in the comments here. Let us know who you're cheering for, what uh, the plans have you excited, what plans you think are pie in the sky and are never going to materialize, um, and join the conversation. And if you're really into this stuff, we have to really thank our mobile internet aficionados. Those are the members of the Mobile Internet Resource Center who fund our work and make videos like this possible. So if you want to join us, please come over to the Mobile Internet Resource Center and we can go a lot deeper in our forums and in our deeper content. So hope you've enjoyed this video. There's a lot of deep, fun, geeky stuff, but um, it's an exciting future and uh, stay connected out there. These videos are brought to you by our premium members, our mobile internet aficionados. They make it possible for us to track this news and create these videos. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe to our channel, or better yet, consider becoming a member yourself.